All right, welcome back to Physics Matt, and today we're going to be finishing up our series on trigonometry. So this will be the third video of the series, and this will be the last video before we start um, on limits, which I view as really the, the start of calculus. So in this video, we're going to be um, introducing a lot of identities and graphs, and I don't want you to memorize much in this video. Really, the, the only thing you need to memorize is the first identity. Um, that shows up a lot in algebra, in trigonometry, and calculus. So that one I, I would keep in the back of your pocket. But the rest of them, I'm just going to introduce them to you. And I would recommend just keeping them in the back of your mind, just knowing that other identities exist that may help you solve problems in the future. And ho hopefully, when you have to solve those problems, you'll have access to um, a formula sheet or uh, the internet to, to look up uh, these definitions. But I don't have them memorized myself, and I wouldn't recommend spending the time and the energy to actually memorize them, just knowing how to use them. And none of these identities are that different than the ones we went through in the past two videos. They're just, it's not really anything new, it's just different equations that you can use to solve problems. So we're going to start off with uh, the one identity I think you should definitely memorize, and that is sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. And in this one, I'm actually going to prove that this is true by rewriting this so it becomes the Pythagorean theorem. And just as a reminder, the, the Pythagorean theorem says for a right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So let's prove that. So in our last videos we we learned that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And again here I'm not writing the thetas or the angles because that's implied in this. Um, so this is really sine of an angle equals the opposite side over the hypotenuse and cosine of that same angle is adjacent over hypotenuse. So let's plug these identities into the original equation. So I'm going to use red for sine and blue for cosine. So sine we said is opposite of our hypotenuse. So we'll plug that in. We'll get O squared or opposite squared over hypotenuse squared plus and we'll plug in adjacent and hypotenuse into cosine squared. So that's going to be adjacent squared over hypotenuse squared, and this will still be equal to one. Now, there's a common denominator on the left-hand side, so I'm going to multiply the entire equation by hypotenuse squared. On the left-hand side, the hypotenuse squared is going to cancel with both of these in the denominator. We're going to be left with opposite squared plus adjacent squared. And on the right hand side, we're just left with hypotenuse squared. And now we're really left with the Pythagorean theorem. Because on a right triangle, we know from the Pythagorean theorem that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, with c being the longest side, and here the hypotenuse is the longest, oh, is the longest side. Oh gosh. All right, I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> so here, hypotenuse is the longest side. So h, o, and a. And since we know the Pythagorean theorem is true, we got to it from this, so we know this identity is true. All right, and now there's a couple other identities we can get from, from this equation here, just by dividing it by another trig identity, or trig factor. So I'm gonna get there by dividing, first by dividing this by sine squared. So we're gonna divide each part of this equation by sine squared and form a new identity that might not have been recognizable in the beginning. So here we have sine squared divided by sine squared equals one. 
you have cosine over sine squared, which if we remember from the last couple videos, um, cosine over sine is cotangent. So this is going to be cotangent squared. And here one over sine squared is cosecant squared. I know it might be hard to rewire your brain and think that this might be secant because it's one over sine, but remember this is this is switched, so one over sine is actually cosecant, even though it seems like it should be secant. So this is another identity we get. It's really the same identity, just in a different form. But if you saw these without a whole lot of a, re of a review, you might not think that these are the same thing, but they are. And now similarly, we can divide by cosine, or cosine squared, and get another identity. So cosine squared, oh, I'm not gonna put the plus symbol, cosine squared, and cosine squared. And here we get sine squared divided by cosine squared, which if re we remember from the last videos, this is tangent squared. We have cosine over cosine, which is one, and one over cosine squared is secant squared. So here we have another identity. Tangent squared plus one is equal to secant squared. And I'm gonna write all of these now just below each other, just to show you the identities and just to show you that even though they look different, a lot of trig identities are actually quite similar. So before we had one plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. And then the original one that we had, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. Even though they look different, these are all really the same equation. All right, let's move on to another identity. Uh, let's see what I had next. So next, um, Again, I don't have these ones memorized. Um, I'm just gonna write them out for you and explain a little bit, of, or give an example of a situation where this might be a useful identity to know. So we're going to rewrite sine squared as a function of a cosine that is not raised to a power. So in this one, sine squared is one plus cosine of two x. and x being the angle here, so we're multiplying the angle by two, divided by two. And similarly, cosine squared is equal to one minus cosine of two x divided by two. I'm not gonna prove these for you. Um, if you're really interested in the proof, I'm sure you can find it on Google or find some other YouTube videos that go through it. Um, but I just want you to know that these exist, and when you're going through calculus, specifically integrals, identities like these will become important because some integrals are very difficult to um, take the integral of, or some functions are very difficult to take the integral of when they have a square of um, a cosine or a sine. Um, but it becomes much easier when you have just the cosine or the sine by itself. So you may have to rearrange or rewrite equations into terms that just have a single unsquared or unpowered cosine um, in them. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more um, further down in the line of this course. But again, for now, just know these are here and when you need them, they're pretty quick to look up. I might even make a formula sheet for this class just in case anybody um, is actually working through another college level class and I can create the formula sheet that I would use and that I would feel comfortable with with most calculus tests or quizzes, and hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a non-right triangle. So we went through SOHCAHTOA, we went through a lot of these trig identities, and so far all of those identities are valid just for right triangles. So triangle, a triangle with one of the angles is equal to 90 degrees. But there are some identities for triangles that don't have a single 90 degree angle. So it could be like that, it could be obtuse, it could be, well, 
this is an acute angle as well, but it could be any type of a triangle, regardless of what angles or sides it has. And I'll just write this one out for you. Um, so in any triangle, I'll, I'll write an, I'll draw a slightly better triangle. So we'll do side A, side B, oh, that looks like a right triangle. <laughs> There, I'll make it look not like a right triangle. So this is going to be side A. So I'm going to write the side, the length of the side is a capital A, and the angle is lowercase a. Side B with lowercase angle B, and side C with lowercase angle C. So if you have an angle and a side, um, this, if you have the side length that's opposite of an angle that you also have, and you're looking for an angle or a side, and you have the corresponding opposite angle or side, that's a, a mouthful, but um, you can find the, the missing piece that you have. So I'm hoping colors will help illustrate this a little better. Um, but the equation to, to find that value is sine Actually, I'll use black, because I'm, I'm just going to start with A. So sine of A, sine of the small angle A, divided by big A, so the side length of A, is going to be equal to sine of the angle B, divided by side length B, which is also equal to sine of C, divided by side length C. So these ratios are going to be equal in any triangle. And this works if you have, let's say you have this side and this angle, and this side and you're looking for this angle, it'll work. When it won't work is if you have one piece from each one of these. So if you have side length B, you have angle C and we'll say angle A. Since you have one piece from each one of these, you won't be able to solve it for the piece you're missing. So you have to have at least two of one of these pairs and then one of the other pair that you're looking for, or the ratio that you're looking for. But you can still solve a triangle if you have um, two angles and a side or um, two sides and an angle. And you can solve that using this last equation. This last equation is a squared plus b squared plus, uh, let's see, oh, sorry, this is actually going to be minus. Again, I don't, I don't have this memorized, but minus 2 AB cosine of angle C. And that's going to equal C squared. Sorry, that's a bit of a long, uh, long equation. Let me just double check that I have it right. AB, AB, yep. So with this equation, you have to have a lot, you have to have a lot of pieces, but you can solve for a piece that you're missing. So if you have side length A and side length B, that's most of the equation there. All we need is angle C, and we can solve for side length C. So with these equations, you can solve, for the most part, any, any triangle, regardless of if it has a right angle in it. If you have enough pieces to actually define a triangle, you should be able to solve for all of the missing pieces. And that's about all I have for the identities. Um, we're going to finish up this video with some graphing of trigonometric functions and try to show you a visual representation of what these functions, of how these functions act. So I'm going to start by drawing an x and y axis. And 
And instead of just putting one, two, three, four, five, I'm gonna put it in terms of pi. So we'll say this is zero, it's pi over two, this is pi, and so on. Two pi, and same on this side, I'm not gonna draw everything. So let's start by graphing sine of x. Or in other words, we're going to be plotting y equals sine of x. So if you plug into a calculator, um, if you plug in zero for sine of x, you're going to get zero. So sine of x starts at the origin. And if you think of the unit circle, this makes sense as well, because let's say you start here, at an angle of zero, because with a unit circle, angles are measured um, with respect to the positive x-axis, and angles uh, move counterclockwise. So sine of x, sine is opposite of our hypotenuse. Um, I forget exactly what I was going to say with that. <laughs> um, but if you have a sine of zero, you have nothing in the y-axis, so it's going to equal zero. So it's going to be at the origin. Now as you move the angle up with sine, the y-axis is going to increase. It's going to keep increasing, so I'll just draw it here, until it reaches a maximum at pi over two angle, or pi over two radians. Um, so again, if we remember from the last video, Moving up 90 degrees is the same as pi over two radians. Keep going to 180 degrees, that's pi over two, or sorry, pi. And then when you go the whole way around, it's two pi. And that has to do with the, the ratio between the, or the relation between the radius and the circumference. So when we move the angle up to the vertical, or pi over two radians, we're going to get a value of one in the y-axis. So sine, of pi over two is gonna equal one. This axis I'll put actual values. So one, negative one. So sine is gonna look like this. And when it goes to the opposite side, eventually it's gonna get back to zero at, um, oops, I screwed that up. At pi over two, it's equal to one. And when it gets back to zero, it's gonna be at pi and then get back to zero at two pi and just keep cycling like this. And it's gonna do that out to infinity and negative infinity. Cosine does something similar, but it's kind of flipped. So cosine, when you're starting at an angle of zero, you have one in the x axis. So now I'll graph cosine in red, so y equals cosine of x. And we're starting out in the x-axis. We start at a value of 1. So cosine is going to start here. I'm sort of mixed markers. Cosine is going to start here. As you increase the angle, so here the distance of um, on the x-axis as the angle increases is going to decrease. The cosine is going to decrease until you get to pi over two where it becomes zero. So the cosine function is going to go right down to zero at pi over two. And once it passes pi over two, it's going to start increasing but in the negative direction. Because on this side the x the x component is going to be negative. So all this to say cosine, oops, cosine is going to look like this. And it's going to do the same thing out to infinity. And what this means is sine, sine and cosine are the same function but moved um, by 90 degrees or by pi over 2. And that's really how you get the identity sine of x equals cosine of, let me see if I got this right, so cosine is red, the so cosine is x plus pi over 2. I'm going to double check that real quick just to make sure that I'm not giving you wrong information, but I'm pretty sure that's true. 
Okay, the, I looked it up, the book that I'm using actually writes it this way. So it, wrote, it writes it as sine of pi over two minus x equals cosine x. But it's basically saying the same thing. We shift it by pi over two and then we get cosine. And now let's consider tangent. So I'm gonna keep this up. I'm gonna keep the graph up that we have, and we're going to think y equals tangent of x. Now when we graph this, we can imagine what this is going to do by realizing that tangent of x is equal to sine over cosine. And we can figure out some weird things about tangent of x just by considering this relation. So the first thing I see here is cosine is going to equal zero at some point. And when cosine is equal to zero, as long as sine isn't equal to zero, this will diverge to infinity because you would essentially have some number divided by zero. You can't divide by zero, but you can approach zero and realize that the value is getting really big. And we'll go into this in more detail in limits, but and this is really the foundation of limits. Uh, but I'm not going to get ahead of myself, just for now, just take it with a grain of salt that a value over zero diverges to infinity. So when cosine is equal to zero, and again, red is cosine, we're going to have an asymptote. So cosine is zero, cosine is zero. So these values are not going to have any meaning um, with tangent of x. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, so I'm trying to be careful with how I describe this. Um, but tangent of x is going to look, I'm running out of color, so I'll use purple. Tangent of x is going to look something like this. And it's going to repeat because we're going to have we're gonna have these asymptotes whenever cosine crosses the axis, crosses the x-axis, or yeah, whenever the y value is zero. So really tangent, this is, I apologize, this is getting kind of busy. Tangent is gonna just keep repeating like this. And cotangent is gonna be the same but opposite. Instead of when cosine crosses the x-axis, cotangent is gonna be when, um, when sine crosses the y, no, sorry, when sine crosses the x-axis. So the sine function is shifted a little bit. Um, again, let me make sure I don't get this right or this wrong because, yeah, I don't have this memorized either. I don't use this super often. And I'm just gonna start over with the x and y axis. So y, x, pi over two, pi, three, pi over two, you get the idea. So here, I'll switch my colors again. So we said, so tangent of x is gonna look like this. With these asymptotes. Cotangent of x is going to equal, uh, what is it? It's going to be like this. With the asymptotes shifted 90 degrees. I, I was hoping this wouldn't be as busy. This looks very busy again, so I apologize, but. Purple is cotangent of x, blue is tangent of x, for the same reason that at the asymptotes, the denominator crosses zero, crosses the x-axis. All right, and the last graphs I wanna show you are uh, cosecant and secant. So we saw sine, we saw cosine, we saw tangent, we saw cotangent. All that's left is secant and cosecant. 
I'm, gonna, I'm going to show you secant and cosecant in terms of uh, sine and cosine. So we'll say sine, sine of x is going to be red and cosine of x is going to be blue. So we said sine looks like this. Oh, sorry, that is not symmetrical. And cosine, uh, I can do this. <laughs> cosine looks like that. So we know that sine is equal, actually now I'll do it in terms of cosecant. So we, we learned before that cosecant equals one over sine and secant is one over cosine. So I want you to think of just dividing each value along this line, or divide, dividing one by each value along this line. So we'll start with secant. So we take one over cosine. Um, since the cosine function crosses y equals one, one divided by one is just going to be one. So secant is actually going to touch cosine right here. And as the values get smaller, the values in the denominator are going to get smaller, which means the value of secant is going to increase. So secant is going to increase as cosine decreases. And we're going to run into the same problem where eventually it's going to cross the x-axis and it's going to have a zero in the denominator. So secant is going to look similar to a para tra parabola. It's not, it is not a parabola because it has an asymptote. But secant is going to look like this. And when the values are negative, secant is going to be negative. So we're going to get the same thing here as well. Oh, that was bad. There we go. So secant is going to be a function, a repeating function like this, where you have one upside down U shape, right side up U shape, upside down U shape, right side up U shape, all centered on the maximums and minimums of the cosine function. And sine is going to be the same thing. The asymptotes are going to be shifted 90 degrees again. And they're just going to be one over the function. So apologies if that was kind of messy, um, but I hope you get the idea of what sine, cosine, secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent look like on a graph. And that's all I have for this video. Uh, next time we're going to start with limits. And again, if I made any mistakes or anything seems unclear, I can always make follow-on videos um, just to supplement these videos. But please let me know in the comments if there's anything, any suggestions or anything you still have issues with.